probablemente porque estaba estudiando el cerebro y no lo suficiente uh, 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 español. So enough, enough Spanish, okay. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I come from a very different part of the world um, from the backgrounds in this room. I've had the pleasure and honor of meeting many of you. And it, just to give you a little bit of, um, about my background, I'm a medical doctor by training, um, also a neuroscientist. So I went to Stanford for medical school and to study neuroscience. And since then, I've developed a professional career in specifically using electricity to interact with the brain for some sort of uh, 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 benefit to humanity. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But just to set the stage, uh, in the next 20 minutes, I want to introduce to you a whole new paradigm of human performance that I will argue has remained untapped until now. So when we think about athletic performance, the vast majority of our efforts in coaching and training has been the neck and below. So it's been about muscles and the heart for endurance. People have neglected the brain. And I will argue that what makes an athlete great versus good is the brain and the rate at which they acquire knowledge from practice. So let me just seed that thought with you and, and, and let's, talk, let's talk a little bit more about the brain and the use of electricity. So this is a snapshot of my last company. I was here for about 10 years. So I was a very early employee, a single digit employee. We raised 250 million US dollars to develop this product. So what you see on the left is very small, the size of a small matchbox, and that gets implanted in the skull with electrodes that get implanted in the brain. Once the surgeon has implanted this equipment in the patient, the system has everything it needs to function by itself for three to five years. So what does it do? The system is constantly monitoring the brain's electrical activity. And if it detects an electrical signal that's suggestive of a seizure about to happen, it proactively delivers a small electrical impulse to the brain to normalize this activity. So epilepsy is a disease of seizures, and I know I'm probably giving the translator hell up there with all these scientific terms. Um, epilepsy is a disease of seizures, and drugs do not work. Often drugs are worse than the disease itself and patients will choose to have the disease than the side effects from the drugs. Here we have a system that uses electricity to basically short circuit the seizure process. Incredibly efficacious. So we had our big day in front of the, uh, the US government, the FDA, and they voted 13 to zero in favor of approval for this product. So this is now live out there helping thousands of people with epilepsy. And in many cases, these people are effectively cured of their epilepsy. So imagine that. And we have a disease that's typically incredibly difficult to treat or impossible to treat with drugs. But if we use electricity to interact with the brain, in many cases, we can cure it. This is not my last company, but this is another example of how electricity can be used in the brain. This is a gentleman with, with Parkinson's disease, and you can see the characteristic tremor. This is the same gentleman literally seconds after you turn on the neurostimulator. I mean, the results are that dramatic. So nurse, these products have been out there this product has been out there for two decades. Many of you in this room have never heard of this product or seen it. But brain stimulation is actually a huge business. There's deep brain stimulation systems for Parkinson's disease. You just saw that. There's spinal cord stimulation systems for chronic pain and so on and so forth. I talked to you about my last company for epilepsy. This is a $5 billion industry every year. So what has been confined, this, the, like using electricity and the brain for this community that we're speaking to may be new, but for, for doctors, it's been around for a long time 
and, and providing incredible benefit for the people who, who have uh, undergone the surgery to have these products implanted. Now, this is the product problem with all of these systems. It's the medical implant. Nobody wants this. Okay, we're talking about electrodes in the brain and pulse generators under the skin. Nobody wants this, even somebody who is very sick. So my vision for Halo, my vision and my co-founder's vision for Halo is what if we can make these neurostimulation systems available without surgery? What if we can harness the technologies of neurostimulation that has been used in medicine successfully for two decades and build it into a wearable package that people know and love and, and, and can use themselves? You know, this is an opportunity that we could really reshape humanity along multiple dimensions. We're talking about sports today, but I want you to, to envision a, a world where uh, there's multiple products like this for multiple different use cases. Okay, so what we found in the scientific literature in looking for technologies that can stimulate the brain from the outside, non-invasively, this is what we found. We found a field that started from zero that grew to 2,000 papers in the span of ten, 10 years. This is amazing. So what started with neurophysiology that led to empirical results, that led to an understanding as to the mechanism as to how this is happening, which led to application, all of this has happened in the last 10 years with explosive growth in, 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 uh, in the published literature. The US military has been playing around with this technology and getting results. So the U United States Air Force has been using this technology to train drone pilots and the Army has been using this technology to train snipers where the training times are accelerated by 2x if you train these soldiers with neurostimulation versus not. So let's talk about how this technology works. It relies on placing electrodes on the scalp to create electric fields that interact with the brain. Now you can be picky in where you put the electrode. Put the, part, put the electrode over the part of the brain that you want to get better. That'll be important in a second. A 20 minute session with neurostimulation, with this electrode, will induce a temporary state of what neuroscientists call hyperplasticity, sorry translator. Uh, another way of saying this is hyperlearning. That lasts for about an hour. So 20 minutes buys you an hour of hyperlearning. Then what you do while you're in the state of hyperlearning is you feed that part of the brain training repetitions quality training repetitions, and if you do that, you will learn at an accelerated rate. Okay, so um, at HALO, our first year of operation, we were more like a research institute than, than a company. Like you imagine Silicon Valley startup companies, we were nothing like that. We didn't think about business one time in our first year. All we cared about was data. And so we did a, a, a bunch of research. We tested a thousand people in our first year, and what we found is the data related to stimulating the special part of your brain called the motor cortex, the special part of your brain that controls movement in our bodies, that if we stimulated this part of the brain and we paired that with movement training, we would get dramatically accelerated results. So movement-based training obviously has an application in sports training. Sports training is movement-based training. So from our lab, we started to work with college level athletes and then professional and Olympic athletes and we continue to, like this, these numbers are, are dated, we've tested over 2,000 people to date. The data really led us to a use case in sports. So I could have never predicted that my nerdy little career in neuroscience would have ever led me to this conference talking to uh, a, a, a room full of sports professionals. Okay, so this is, um, over here on the right, you see a cartoon of what Halo Sport looks like. Halo Sport is our first product. And you'll notice that it looks like a set of headphones. And the reason for that is because neuroanatomically, the part of your brain that controls movement 
sits right above your ears. So any set of headphones, Beats or Bose or JBL, it doesn't matter, the arch of the headphone just naturally goes over the motor cortex. So you can see here, uh, this, is, this is Halo Sport. You can see these special um, features on the underside of the arch of the headphone. That's where the business happens. Those little pieces we call primers, but effectively those are electrodes that create the electric field that interact with your brain. Uh, let's go, you know, we are a very data forward company. Let's look at some data. So here uh, we're working at an elite training facility in, in, in Dallas, Texas, owned by Michael Johnson, who's a four-time Olympic gold medal winner. You might remember him from the gold shoes. So here we had access to uh, elite college football and basketball players. And we had them for about two weeks. We split the group up into two. Half of the athletes got neurostimulation, the other half did not. Everybody got the same training program and then we did before and after testing to compare the two groups. So if you look at, and here we're testing for how explosive the leg muscles can be. So you could see that the group that got neurostimulation improved by about 12% versus the group that did not got better by about 2%. So this really piqued our interest and gave us the confidence that started to start working with athletes of an even higher level. So now we're starting to work with um, the United States Olympic ski team. Um, and here we're specifically looking um, at the way these athletes jump. So there's two aspects of a jump. We want a jump with good technique that we can measure with a force plate. We can measure the wobble of the jump. A jump with less wobble is a, is a more skilled and technical jump. A jump with more wobble is a, a, a poor movement quality and we can, we can use math to assign a score to this. And then another aspect of the jump is the raw amount of force produced in the jump and that's called the net positive impulse. Many of you in the room know about that. Okay, so this, this graph over here is an example of a poor jump. You could see these wobbles in the curve. We can measure it mathematically. A 4.9 is no good. That's a lot of wobble. Over here on the right is 0.9. This is a much better jump, and visually you can even see that. It's a much smoother curve. Going from left to right is teachable. The coach and the athlete can have a discussion about what is creating each one of these little wobbles. And over time, you can train towards the skill to produce a jump like you see on the right. Another thing that we can look at is the area under the curve. So you want a bigger hump that, that, that looks at the net positive impulse or the total amount of force that's produced. So here, um, lower is better, the yellow line is the halo group, the gray line is the control group, and you can see that wobble reduction is better at any given time point in the halo group versus the, the control group. And then if we look at net positive impulse, so more positive is better in this case, the halo group does better than the control group, and you could see at the end, the halo group gets better by 31% versus 18% in the control group. So we're really proud of this data. And um, you know, it really teaches towards, um, uh, it really, you know, for me, like looking at this, it really starts to shed light into what makes an athlete great. Like what makes LeBron James, LeBron James? What makes Messi, Messi? The greats are the great because they learn faster from a, the same amount of practice. Right, everybody practices a lot. Some people get more out of practice, some people get less, right? Now the greats get more out of practice. They learn faster than the regular people. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to accelerate the rate that you learn from practice, right? And if you think about practice, practice costs the athlete time, fatigue, risk of injury. Practice is expensive to the athlete. 
if you have a way to maximize the neurologic gains from, from practice, this is an opportunity to really make the athlete better, intrinsically, the performance of the athlete. Okay, so, you know, there's applications beyond sports. As a medical doctor, I'm really excited about this. So, the, the, in the same way we could help an athlete get more from their physical training, what if we can help a stroke victim get more from their physical therapy, right? Same principles of it, using neurostimulation to induce temporary states of hyperlearning and then feeding the brain reps, we, could, we have the opportunity, I think, to really reshape the way we think about medicine and the practice thereof. So uh, there's applications in the military. So uh, the, the, um, the military is actually Halo's biggest customer. We're active with all four branches of the military. We focus only on special operations. And in a short amount of time, uh, we really have an elite group of both coaches and trainers and athletes, um, all believers in the technology, and, um, and I, I couldn't be more excited to be working with um, this really amazing crew of people. So let me leave you with this. I'm about to get the hook. Think about the things in your life that you want but can't have because of your brain. This is the good part. Our brains have latent capacity to learn, to retain, and process. What if we can unlock this potential? What would you start learning today if you can tap into that potential? What if you wanted to learn guitar? What if you wanted to learn Italian? These things you might want in your life, but you don't even start because it takes too long to learn. We want to challenge the 10,000 hour rule. We think it sucks. What if we could reduce 10,000 to 5,000? What would you start today? So thank you very much for your time.